Welcome to the Women Changing the World podcast, a podcast on a mission to bring you some of the most amazing women I know who are doing incredible things to generally make the world a better place. From corporate sustainability to straight up magic and everything in between, you'll meet the real life humans who are birthing the new. I'm your host, Liz Best, and I'm here to amplify the stories and voices of women who are changing the world. Welcome to the Women Changing the World podcast. I had the pleasure of sitting down recently with Heather Mack, who is Principal Advisor of Heather Mack Consulting and one of three co-founders of Diversity and Sustainability, and it was such a treat. We chatted about Heather's career journey working in a number of different sustainability capacities from retail industry lobbyist to practitioner in Canada and the UK to founder of her own consultancy in 2018. And we also discussed the very important work that diversity and sustainability is doing to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion within the field of sustainability, as well as what those of us in this field can do to create a more diverse and inclusive future. I just know you're going to enjoy my conversation with Heather as much as I did, and I can't wait to hear what you think. Welcome to another new episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. I am so, so, so excited to be sitting down with today's guest, Heather Mack. Heather is the co-founder of Diversity and Sustainability and a principal advisor for Heather Mack Consulting. Um, Heather, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Liz. Ah, of course. It's seriously my pleasure. Um, and maybe before, I mean, I have so, so many questions I want to ask you. Um, but before we jump into all the things, would you mind briefly introducing yourself to our listeners? Sure, sure. So as you already said, I'm Heather Mack. I'm uh, the principal advisor for uh, my own consultancy, Heather Mack Consulting. And I'm also the co-founder of Diversity and Sustainability. I'm a mom. I'm a wife, sister, and daughter. Um, I love gardening and composting, food markets, traveling, um, architecture, and snorkeling. And that's just a little bit about me. Oh, my goodness. I love that. And what a diverse set of hobbies. (laughs) Indeed. Yep. Where's your favorite place that you've ever been snorkeling? So, yeah, I I just actually recently came back from the Cayman Islands. And so that was really, um, really a great place to go. I I never thought much about going there because it's always, you know, the Cayman Islands, that's where you evade taxes. But it's it's actually a really great um, snorkeling destination. So highly recommend it. Oh, good to know. It's where you evade taxes and snorkel. (laughs) That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, well, I, I asked like my one of my biggest questions first on the podcast, um, which is it's always just so interesting to me to hear what different women um, have to say on this. Um, but because this is the Women Changing the World podcast, um, if you had to pick one thing that you wanted to change about the world, what would your one thing be? Yeah, this was a really tough question. I think for me, I think the one fundamental thing that we need to change is just changing mindsets in terms of our need to reconnect with nature and its and its beauty, basically. So rebuild that reverence for the wonder of nature, um, but also for all of us to see each other as individuals, but also nature as our as our kin. So I, mm. I see that as a fundamental piece that has to change for everything else to change as well in terms of sustainability. Mm, I love that answer. Um, it's like bringing like the, the kinship to our relationship with mother earth. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 
Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'd love to hear, we're definitely going to talk a lot about diversity and sustainability. Um, but before we do, I would love to hear a little bit more about your consulting work. Yeah, for sure. So my focus has always been in the world of consumer goods and retail. So I actually got my start of my career in the marketing field in, in consumer goods at a um at a German candy company. So I've always had this interest in food and, you know, pop art, sort of the everyday consumer. And so my my day-to-day -day, um, practice and consulting is focused on sustainability strategy, on stakeholder engagement, um, and more lately with the growth of ESG, a lot of uh, reporting type work. And I see myself as someone who helps companies translate the big picture and anticipate these issues that are coming over the horizon. Um, lately, I've been doing a bit more thinking about pivoting service offerings. So, for example, rounding up my ability to build the change within organizations to become more inclusive and trying to figure out what that fused view looks like as well. Mm, that's so interesting because yeah I mean obviously like, well I'm like maybe obviously to us maybe not obviously to everyone in the world but like <laughs> the two are so closely interconnected yes exactly yeah I think that notion of making change is so um it's common to both the DEI space and the sustainability space so it's trying to build the muscle in one but I think it really helps the other as well Absolutely. Well, and I think to in order to really fully integrate sustainability and ESG um, and impact and purpose and inclusion and diversity, like throughout the business, like they're all so mutually reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Definitely. Cool. Um, well, I would love to hear. I mean, I think the work that you are doing at Diversity and Sustainability is it's so important. It is so, so, so needed in our space. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how it came about and what the organization does? Absolutely. So we formed in uh, June 2020. So basically after uh, George Floyd's murder, um, the murder of Breonna Taylor. Uh, and so it was just a time of, of deep reflection. And I think for me, there was a lot of that thinking of, okay, so working in sustainability for the past let's say 14, 15 years, we haven't had a lot of colleagues that were people of color. And so I think there was that notion of, okay, the need to create community. The other aspect was, I, I thought a lot, a, bit, uh, a lot about the systemic issues within sustainability. And, um, you know, I've always focused on food and consumer goods. And I reflected a lot about um, the origins of, of some of the food commodities that I focused on. So whether it's been sugar or cocoa, um, you know, a lot of these models of sourcing were, were founded on slavery. And, and you can see how so much of the issues that we're trying to resolve, they, they still persist today. So really, I, I think I went through a bit of an existential crisis and thought about so who is not in these discussions that needs to be in these discussions? And so that's how um, diversity and sustainability was born. So I um, connected with a few former colleagues and we decided to form this organization. So how we were trying to accomplish that, we really wanted to create the sense of community by centering the voices of uh, BIPOC or BAME practitioners. And we also had this mission to shift the industry to be more inclusive. And to do that, we wanted to help build the skills uh, profile and access to opportunities for current and future BIPOC sustainability leaders and allies. And um, the other thing was just really trying to build a sense of allyship within the sector and advancing thinking through, through thought leadership as well. Oh, very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. I am. Um, I don't know that I had heard the full origin story, but I, I love the the breadth of of the different ways that you're approaching this challenge. And that sense of community um, also really strikes a chord. I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about like what your day to day looks like, you know, being involved in both your own consulting work as well as in, um, you know, working in this organization? 
For sure. So I often joke that if someone were to stand behind me all day, they would just see a normal office worker, just someone clacking away on the keyboard <laughs> and <laughs> on Zoom calls. Um, but I think in my day to day, it, it definitely varies. So I'm in a lot of meetings usually, if not for work, uh, for diversity and sustainability, I'm usually chatting with people to um, engage and make new connections, you know, creating new events, fundraising, um, or, you know, interviewing people for research. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of just outreach. And I would say over the past two years, I've, I've never talked to so many interesting people. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I think that's been one of the, one of the things that I've loved about um, diversity and sustainability. Totally. Oh, that's so cool. Well, and, and just so we have a sense as, as listeners too, like, how many people are on the diversity and sustainability team, like doing outreach and advancing the mission? Yeah, so um, we're a group of three co-founders and we have um, two interns working with us as well as, you know, one or two others who are uh, quite involved in the day to day. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a group effort between between the lot of us, uh, whether it's, um, you know, engagement, putting together events, making it look presentable, uh, <laughs> you know, moderating a Google group. Um uh, writing and and all sorts of things so it's it's quite a, an undertaking and, and we're just in the process of trying to think through what it looks like long term um, so that we're not always uh, doing things off the side of our desk all the time mm -hmm. absolutely that makes a lot of sense um, well, I, I feel like one of the things that I hear a lot from people who listen to the podcast um, I mean, I think about what makes me interested in listening to podcasts is it's really people tell me it's really interesting to hear. And I agree. I love hearing like how people came to be where they are today. Um, and especially while while someone standing behind you might think you just look like a normal office worker. <laughs> you have such an interesting portfolio of things that are on your plate. And so um, if you're willing to give us kind of like the full story, whether it goes back to the German candy company or, <laughs> or further or more recent, would love to hear uh, just a little bit more about your journey and how you came to be here. Of course, yes. So um, just if we go all the way back, I'm the daughter of, of two Chinese immigrants. So they came to Canada in the um, 1970s. And um, my mom specifically has always been someone who's always had this mentality of making yourself useful and helping out others. So I think that's always been a theme in my life. Um, and then as a kid in the 80s and 90s, I think the, the stories that that dominated my worldview were, uh, you know, rainforest dest uh, destruction or deforestation in the Amazon, um, acid rain. Uh, I remember doing projects on the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska. And I've always had this interest in volunteering or, or serving the community as well. But I think um, as I was younger, uh, just um, I always thought this community-based work or environmental work was something you did on the side. And, you know, I rarely ever saw anyone like myself in the field. So I, I didn't really think of it as a career necessarily. I do remember a discussion I was having with, with a mentor back then, and he was saying, you know, that's the sort of thing that you do after you make your millions. And I was mm. like, my goodness. <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's a different way of, of thinking back then. Um, but I think by the time I went to university, um, I was taking a course at McGill called the, the Social Context of Business with this professor named um, Louis Chauvin. And that really formed the basis of my knowledge in terms of, you know, how business and society interact, what the social and environmental issues are. And I remember that summer, I, I ended up working at a big um, consumer goods company. And we had this big um, sales conference. And I remember the president was talking and um, he had a Q&A session. And I remember just walking up to the microphone and asking him, you know, how are we supposed to be sustainable if we rely on pushing people to consume more? Mm -hmm. And so I think he was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you asked me this question. And like I, I had been struggling to think of the answer to that. And 
it, you know, it was really telling to me that he didn't have an answer either. And so I just thought, wow, there's so much more that needs to be done by business. So even at that point, I think it, that was like early 2000s. It didn't occur to me that I could work on sustainability in business or for a consumer goods company. And it wasn't until I got my first job out of university at this German candy company. And um, I got a lot of cavities. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I uh, took over one of my colleagues' maternity leave roles. She was working in sales with Walmart. And so at that time, they sort of said, we're going to commit to 100% renewable energy, we're going to commit to zero waste and sell sustainable products. And I thought, oh my gosh, here's the world's largest retailer making these humongous commitments. And, you know, they've always been seen as the big baddie. And so I thought, wow, can we use this scale um, to, to make change? And so I was very excited by that. And it was then I realized, my goodness, maybe I can combine my interest in environmental and social issues in business. So I went back to school, um, did my MBA. And um, when I when I finished, I um, got a job at Canadian Business for Social Responsibility and um, did some consulting with consumer goods companies and retailers, um, telecommunications companies. Uh, and then um, always had this urge to move abroad, and I'd always wanted to live and work in in the UK. I always saw it as a place where you know people are really pushing the envelope on sustainability thinking. And it it just so happened um, the the CEO at CBSR she had founded the company with. Um, Mark Lee, who uh, was at BSR previously, but uh, he was an executive director at Sustainability in London. And so I had a, a chat with him and he was just giving me tips on, you know, moving to the UK. And he just said, hey, we actually have this opening in, in the London office. And so it was very uh, serendipitous. And I interviewed, managed to get the role. And yeah, we moved over there for a few years. And yeah, it was it was just a great learning experience. And um, but we we ultimately missed missed home, mm -hmm. and uh, moved back to Canada again after that. I got a job uh, working as a lobbyist on sustainability issues for the retail industry, and that was so interesting. I always saw that as, oh my gosh, a lobbyist? Aren't they really greasy? And <laughs> <laughs> and I, I found it so bizarre that I was now in like a lobbyist registry. Um, but it was so fascinating working on the issues uh, from that point of view and just learning how influence works and how to affect change on policy. Um, so I, I found that a really interesting experience. I worked on things like animal welfare on uh, human rights issues. So while I was there, um, it was unfortunately when uh, Rana Plaza happened. So really trying to coordinate the response for the, the Canadian retail industry. So that was a, um, a, a just very harrowing experience, but so much learned as well. Um, I then got an opportunity to work with uh, one of my, my favorite clients. So um, at, at Tim Hortons. So Tim Hortons is a, a Canadian coffee and donut chain um, now owned by Burger King. But uh, at the time, it was a, a Canadian organization. Um, I was there for a very short amount of time because they were taken over by a, a private equity company. And uh, after that was a bit adrift for a little bit, but then landed at the team um, at Deloitte. And so I was there for a few years. And then that leads us to 2018 when uh, after I had my daughter, I did a bit of soul searching and thought, my goodness, if I'm, you know, I have I have a daughter now. And so every moment that you spend um, outside of that, it you've got to make it count. So I said, I'm going to start my own organization. And that's when Heather Mac Consulting was born. And uh, yeah, I've continued my practice of working with uh, retail and consumer goods companies doing some work in Canada and the US and as well as Europe as well. And then we started diversity and sustainability in, in 2020, as I alluded to earlier. So that's really what it's it's looked like from um, from way back when. 
Oh my goodness. It's, it's been such an interesting journey. I mean, you've had just such a range of experiences and I will say like, personally, I love that you had, um, or that you have the lobbying experience. Actually, <laughs> I don't know if, if I had shared this with you, but my first role out of grad school had a lobbying component and I found it so fascinating and so useful <laughs> to, yes. le- to learn like the art of lobbying so early in my career because I think so much sustainability work at the end of the day is often internal lobbying to get people on board. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. And it's just like how, how you influence decisions and and how to get people on side with you. It, it is such a skill set to have. So I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but long term, I don't know if I can do it, but I, I really enjoyed the experience. <laughs> totally. Well, I, I can say that I know what was tough for me is that like often getting to like consensus and or advocating for the business was not always like landing in the place that my like radical soul wanted things to go. Right. So. <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. Oh, so interesting. Um well, thank you so much. And again, I just, you've had such a, such an interesting journey and so cool to hear. Um, I know you've mentioned to me previously that you see kindness and empathy as the foundation for behavior change, which I love and uh, is so interesting, you know, given again, the range of experiences that you've had. I would love to hear more about your theory of change, anything you're willing to share about how you think we change the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I think generally behavior change, it takes a lot of levers, um, big and small. So, uh, you know, it could be policy change and that kind of thing. But I think if we go back to um, this idea of, of empathy and kindness, I think if we look at the past few years, um, even the past five years, we've really been focused on uh, in, in more in society on driving shame and, and dunking on people. And, you know, I think that's helpful for driving awareness, but that hard work is building those connections and networks and relationships and bringing people along for the journey to make that change. I think you probably saw that as a lobbyist too. It's, it's all about those relationships and bringing people along. And just no one wants to change when they feel under attack. They, they're they more focused on defending themselves. And I, I've come to realize it's better to appeal to people's better nature and, and find that common ground. So I think um, just having that mutual respect and, and having that, um, you know, you're looking out for this person and approaching them from a place of kindness. I think they respond better to that and more likely to work with you to make that change that you that we need to see. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. And I think um, I'm curious, like, would you also extend that? What was coming up for me is like, is what um, what makes organizations change? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I see. I also feel like when you think about like the influence external stakeholders have on a company's sustainability or diversity practices, um, often approaching with the like, we're your partner and we want you to do better, I think is met with a lot more receptivity than the like, we're going to make you do what we want you to do no matter what. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. The, the threats, I think, um, yeah, they're great for awareness building and, and, you know, starting some action, but that long-term action is, is really brought by holding hands, I think. Yes. And, and it's a beautiful visual. <laughs> <too>. <laughs> well, I'd love to change topics a little bit um, and talk about Uh, The report that you put out last September, which is the State of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the Sustainability Space, it is, like, I think it should be kind of, like, required reading for many people (laughs) in our profession. It's, um, you know, really comprehensive and well done. It drew on 1,500 survey responses, I think, and 30 interviews with practitioners. Yes, that's right. What an undertaking. Um, (laughs) I'm I'm curious if you can share some of the key findings. Yes, of course. So this was quite a labor of love for me last year. Um, But I think some of the key findings that we found in the report. So I think the main one was that 
sustainability is really an elite field. It's, you know, people come from middle and upper class backgrounds. You know, 75% of the people that responded to the survey came from uh, middle and upper class backgrounds. And 90% have at least a bachelor's degree. And, and it's really amazing to note that 62% have at least a master's degree. So that's really, really high. Um, so you can imagine how that shapes people's worldview and, and the solutions it creates. I, I think the other piece for me was that um, you know, we work in sustainability and to some extent you have this belief that we're more evolved or more virtuous than others, but truly we have similar issues to other industries. So, um, you know, some of the findings we found, um, white men dominate the, the leadership positions, they feel very involved and, and engaged in organizations. Uh, black and South Asian practitioners and those from materially poor and working class backgrounds feel left behind in the sector. Um, so so that, that just struck me as, my goodness, are we no different from other industries? Um, and then I think one other really interesting finding was that just younger practitioners are, are more diverse. So I, I think when you look at the data, the, the younger that you get, um, the more diverse it is. And so, you know, we have to be ready for this demographic shift and, and create organizations where where people feel psychologically safe, basically. So that's that's just a few of the, the findings. There was just so many, <laughs> it's hard to condense at times, but um, we're, we're just in the process of um, doing a bit of a follow-up to it. So the inclusion blueprint dialogues and really to unpack these survey results and um, and have these dialogues with different stakeholder groups. And basically to come out of that, we'll create stakeholder specific pledges that all of us can take in the industry to, to make it much more inclusive. Oh, that's very cool. Um, and where, where in the process of that are you right now? I'm just noting we're speaking it's early summer 2022. <laughs> Yes, so we're just in the planning process and we expect that uh, we'll do our first one in the fall of this year, uh, of 2022. So um, yeah, so just stay tuned on that. Very cool. Very cool. Well, in the meantime, um, I'm curious, what are some of the most impactful things that we can be doing as practitioners to really help move the industry toward a more diverse and inclusive future? Yeah, so there's a few things. I think one of the most important things we can do is just to reflect and learn about the history of our sector and even some of the industries that we work with and, and the worldviews that dominate within it. I think, you know, we, we get really caught up in our day to day. And, and I think just thinking about the historical aspects of things and, and how it informs what we do today, that that's really important. I think it's also important to reflect on our own headwinds and tailwinds of our own journey. So, you know, how did I get where I where I am today? Uh, what has helped me? What has hindered me? And also to think through that um, from an organizational perspective as well. So a lot of reflecting. Um, I think uh, it's also important to amplify voices that we don't hear so often. So, um, yeah, I, I think... Uh, as some of our, our role for diversity and sustainability is just giving that platform for people we don't see in conferences often or, um, yeah, it, it, and it's really been so uh, rewarding to hear so many new stories and, and viewpoints, I think. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, I think one fundamental thing that underpins a lot of DEI work is this notion of psychological safety. So just creating these spaces for that, um, really approaching things from an attitude of positive intent, being curious and humble. Um, another one is just devoting resources to um, inclusion initiatives. I think a lot of a lot of organizations try to do this off the side of their desk. And, and really, this is something that um, takes a long term investment, I think it's a good proxy for sustainability activities as well. And I think the last one um, that I really heard a lot of was just, you know, pay a living wage, I think uh, there's a lot of internships in the sustainability sector that are unpaid, 
um, you know, a lot in the UN, for example, that are unpaid. Um, and so that's one piece. So paying a living wage and that allows everybody to be able to participate. Um, and then also to be flexible about how people work. So I think with the pandemic, you know, everyone's been working from home and that's benefited a lot of folks, um, whether it's people who are parents, whether that's people who might have a disability. Um, and, and so I think that's really been um, of benefit to, to a lot of folks. So I think those are just some of the um, impactful things that people can, can do to, to be more inclusive. Oh, thank you so much. That was such a comprehensive answer. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love how like actionable and practical your recommendations are in terms of like the reflection and um, the allyship piece, but also um, some of these things I'm like, oh, yes, can we please stop having unpaid internships? It's so <laughs> wrong. It just really yep. disincentivizes people. You know, it just makes it so challenging for people who cannot afford to work for free to get the experience that then becomes a prerequisite to the next thing. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I, I love that in the in the vein of shining a spotlight on other voices, it's something that we're really passionate about over here on the podcast. Um, and I love that you recently started a diversity and sustainability career series, which has featured some of my all-time favorite sustainability leaders, including Noemi Jimenez, who was on the podcast recently, and Jesse Nishinaga. Um, what have been some of your takeaways from the conversations so far? Yeah, so um, yeah, so we've had two of these sessions, and you've alluded to both of the folks there for the career series. So I think the biggest takeaway for me, and, and just so many things about diversity and sustainability, is just how unique and interesting everyone's stories are. So um, as I said earlier, we're just so used to going to conferences and seeing the same people over and over again and hearing the same stories. So it's just been so refreshing to um, give platforms to people who we may not necessarily see on, on main stages. And so I think when, uh, for example, when Jesse had his session, he was reflecting on how his interest in sustainability came from his family's involvement in uh, the Japanese redress and reparations movement. And so like that to me was just um, so, so interesting. And I, I've gone down this big rabbit hole of, of learning about it and how we can apply it to other racial and, and social justice movements. But yeah, I, I think for me, it's just like having this ability to hear from people like Jesse and Noemi and, and um, yeah, and, and just opening new doors to, to new knowledge and indulging that curiosity as well. Totally. Well, I think it's... Um... For all of us, I think as we're like looking ahead in our lives and our careers, it can be so helpful to see people who like look like us who are doing the kinds of things that we aspire to do, um, you know, whatever that may be or mean. And I, it's so cool to me that you're you're shining a spotlight on such people, such interesting people who are doing such cool work. Absolutely. And you too. And you too. Oh, thank you. Um well, and I guess to get a little bit meta, <laughs> going back to some <laughs> philosophy questions, I know that um, you're a big believer that solving for the most vulnerable is something that helps all of us. And um, as someone who's worked in the human rights field, it's definitely something that I believe in as well. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your philosophy on this and, and maybe specifically to what it can look like in practice. For sure. Yeah. So... I think in general, um, it's safe to say that none of us have all of the answers. Um, <laughs> and I think it's oftentimes that the people who are closest to the issue often have the answers, but not all the resources. Mm -hmm. So I think to me, I think it, it's important to make it easy for people who are impacted to participate. I, I think um, working in the corporate sustainability field, sometimes people might approach stakeholder engagement as a bit of a checkbox exercise. Like, okay, I talked to this person in the community, check, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that really doesn't serve anyone. Um, 
So I, again, I think it's about involving people the most impacted in, in decision making. And so I think when um, one example is when we were trying to uh, start diversity and sustainability, we've been really, really uh, deliberate in engaging as many people in a meaningful way as possible. So at this point, I, I, I'm sure we've talked to over 500 people, which is <laughs> pretty, wow. pretty substantial. And um, in creating our advisory panel, we we really tried to cast the net very wide in terms of, you know, not only looking for people who are very experienced in the sector, but also, for example, having three um, three youth participants who are uh, bring such an interesting set of life experiences and viewpoints. So. Yeah, so it, it's it's been really, really um, helpful to do that and, and just shapes how we operate as an organization. It, it takes a lot longer, of course, but I, I think it'll, it'll take us farther in terms of the impact that we want to have. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. And I love that you included three uh, youth like positions on um, your advisory committee. I, that's something that has just long seemed wrong to me that when we talk about like board diversity, for example, there like is almost never a conversation about the age (laughs) of most boards. It's like, how are you making decisions for the future when the future's not in the room? Exactly. Exactly. That seems so wrong to us too. We're like that. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's such a different mindset. I think, um, you know, I'm of the older millennial generation. um, And, you know, there's people on our advisory panel who are in the boomer generation, Gen X, um, Gen Y, or the millennials and and Gen Z. And so, you know, I think the older generation, a lot of folks kind of wanted to change institutions from within and, and, you know, make that incremental change. But I think with the younger folks, they're like, we need to wholesale rebuild everything. And so just working with that dynamic has been um, a good way to, to test different concepts. So I, I've really found these discussions so engaging with them. Oh, that's so interesting. And yeah, I mean, I think um, I am also, I think I'm sort of middle older millennial, depending (laughs) on how you slice it. Uh, And I think like we seemed so radical to (laughs) our predecessors. (laughs) But then I look at like the way that Gen Z is approaching things and I'm like, oh, now I feel conservative. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's so true. It's so true. And then you know, you learn things like, who is Doja Cat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so so that's been uh, great. I'm like, oh my goodness, now I'm that old lady wearing furry slippers. <laughs> totally, totally. I was just talking to a friend last night about how we don't have any idea what to wear anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, well, I guess keeping in, in the same vein of like, I mean, I feel like the youth. <laughs> I, I feel old even <laughs> saying that, but I, no, I feel like young people are seriously so inspiring uh, to me right now. Um, and uh, I I love asking people, you know, who have had maybe more life experience, what advice they wish they could give to their younger selves. And you can totally pick an age or just give some like generic younger self advice. But what do you wish younger Heather uh, could hear or or know that you know now? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think of the the younger, awkward Heather at age 13 when, you know, I was feeling really out of place. Um, so I, I went to a school with a lot of very wealthy kids, kids of business leaders and, and diplomats. And so I often felt very out of place with my Asian heritage and, and working class upbringing. But I think my advice to my younger self would be to know who you are, own it. Uh, and really just know that story about what makes you unique. So I, I think it's just really embracing who you are and and going with it. So that, mm. that is uh, that is me to my my 13 year old self. Uh, I love that. And I also feel like probably so hard to receive as a 13 year old. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, totally. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking about when my own daughter turns 13. Um, that like, I, I wonder what that will look like for her. <laughs> uh, totally, totally. Hopefully, I mean, but that, again, I will say that's another thing that's really inspiring to me from younger people is that 
in uh, this is a broad oversimplification, but I, it does seem as though people are much more in touch with who they are and less apologetic than I know I was yes. at that age. Totally, totally. I, I think there's... I, of all the young people that um, I've interacted with for diversity and sustainability, it is so neat to see like that level of self-awareness, their interest in so many of these social issues. It's it's really incredible to see that level of engagement. Absolutely. So cool. Um, well, sticking in the inspiration vein, uh, I love hearing like what inspirational quotes are inspiring you right now. So what would you say if you had to pick one is your favorite inspirational quote at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I have this little board above my desk and there's a quote on it that I that's like right above my my computer screen. So I see it every day. Um, it's a quote from Quincy Jones, the producer, musician, uh, multi-hyphenate. I think he does everything. <laughs> but uh, he has this quote, um, make decisions out of love and not fear. Um, so yeah, and so to me that, is such a good reflection of someone whose life I admire. He's done so much in terms of producing these incredible albums. You know, he's a producer for Fresh Prince. Um, he's done so much humanitarian work and he's always stuck to what he believes in. Um, and uh, I, when, I think when I've applied that way of thinking to my own life, when I focused on, you know, the future I want to see that's positive and not thinking from a place of fear that's always when I've made the best decisions for the long term mm. and when I've been happiest as well so yeah so that's something I try to remind myself every day about yes that's such brilliant advice and um not always easy to implement but it is those decisions that we make from like the mo our most like radiant abundant confident optimistic self <laughs> Like, yes, yes, comes from a place of love are, are just often so much more fulfilling than the other ones. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, well, what are you most looking forward to right now? Yeah, so this is more on a um, personal note, but uh, I was mentioning at the beginning, I, I just took a holiday to the Cayman Islands. And so I've started to take scuba diving lessons. And, Ooh. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think for me, I'm just hoping to spend more time in the underwater world and just be more hands on with conservation work. I think, you know, in I think everyone gets very cerebral very quickly with sustainability work. And, and so I've been craving that idea of doing more hands-on work, um, mm -hmm. you know, other than picking up garbage in the local area. But um, <laughs> so I, I think, uh, yeah, it's something that brings me a lot of joy and, and also a lot of peace being underwater. So just really looking forward to that. Oh, that's so cool. Where's your current dream scuba diving destination? Yeah, I would love to go over to um, uh, Indonesia one day and just uh, spend some time there. Um, just such a beautiful country and, and so much to see. But yeah, it's it's my dream to go over there one day to, <laughs> to do some scuba diving. Oh, very cool. I very much hope that that comes true sooner than later. I know <laughs> Bali you. just, op or I think yeah, Indonesia as a whole just opened back up to tourists not too long wow. ago. So. <laughs> it's more possible than it was. Yes, <laughs> than a year ago. That's true. <laughs> totally. Well, and, and you can totally um, go back to any of the other wise and brilliant nuggets of <laughs> that you've already shared. But I do ask everyone on the podcast, um, I like you, I love that you referenced your board with your quote, because I'm sitting here surrounded by uh, a number of post-it notes that like make me look probably certifiable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so many people I feel like um, who are on the podcast and in my world in general, like we have these little reminders to ourselves, like in various places <laughs> in our lives and work. Um, so if, if one day I would love to pull some of them together and, and create like a deck of them. So stay tuned <laughs> on that front. Um, and I'm curious, is there a quote um, that you would want to have included in that deck as a reminder to other women in the impact space? Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny you say that. I have a little post-it note with, <laughs> with a few <laughs> points that I have to remind myself all the time. 
Um, so I tend to be a person that like just jumps into things and I'm like, this person definitely knows where I'm coming from. But one is always a reminder to step back and give context. Um, the second one is to um, have positive or assume positive intent. So just, mm. you know, don't assume someone is attacking you. It's like people, there's probably a misunderstanding behind things. So that's another one. Um, another one I have is validating the feelings of other people. So don't ignore that. I, that's a really important part of the equation. And then the fourth one is that your opinion matters. So just mm -hmm. remembering that, you know, you're not just a body in the room, you're, you're there for a reason. So always just um, remembering that you have a unique perspective to offer. Oh my goodness. That's like such a pot of gold. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> all of those. I um, especially love step back and give context. I mean, I, I love them all, but I, I'll never forget like at some point pretty early in my career, I like forgot to do introductions in a meeting. Like I just kind of like jumped straight in it did, and it did not go well. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, yeah, so often, and especially when we're excited about stuff, we can just want to like run right into it. But taking a minute to like frame everything can be so helpful. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, so good to just remind myself that all the time. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It applies to so many things. Um, well, thank you so much. I mean, honestly, I could talk to you for hours. I definitely <laughs> want to hear more about all the work that you're continuing to do in the future. And for other people who are listening, who would like to follow along with you, who want to support and champion the work that you're doing through diversity and sustainability, um, what's the best way for us to do those things? Yeah, so I would say to uh, go to our website, which is at diversityandsustainability.com. We're on all the various social media channels. Um, but I think the best way to keep in touch with us is to join our Google group. And it's a great way to get access to different opportunities and also to um, hear about what we're up to next. Uh, so those are those are probably the best ways to to follow along with us. Perfect. And is the best way to join the Google group from the website? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. And what about following along with you and your consulting work? Yeah. So I have my various Twitter meanderings. <laughs> um, <laughs> my my handle is Heather K. Mack, M-A-K. Um, and then my, my consulting uh, website is at um, heathermackconsulting.com. But uh, yeah, just my Twitter is always the best the best um, inlet into into what I'm thinking <laughs> most days. Very cool. We'll be sure to include links to all of the above in the show notes for people who are listening and want to check any or all of them out. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great speaking with you, Liz. Oh, it's been such a treat, Heather. I so appreciate it. Um, and I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing on all fronts. And you too as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Please rate and review the Women Changing the World podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe for future episodes. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is liz.best, that's L-A-S dot B-E-S-T, or you can find me on LinkedIn by searching my name, Liz Best. Join my mail list by visiting elizabethbest.com slash monthly meditation, and you'll receive all the latest updates on events, retreats, and opportunities to work with me, plus a monthly love note from my heart to your inbox. I am so excited to keep in touch, and I'll see you in the next episode.